On this week's episode, we have Susan Hamilton Muir, and she's a brand strategist and visual artist and the founder of Susan Muir Studio. She's on a mission to dispel the myth that creativity and strategy are at odds to help business leaders electrify their work and amplify their impact. Susan has developed a unique point of view that is driven by the merger of analytical and creative thinking. She's designed a set of processes and tools that get teams to problem solve more creatively, helping them define their mission, vision, and differentiators with clarity and brings their brands to life in the world. She has gravitated towards healthcare, which offers up the exciting challenge of finding creative solutions for some of the most complex problems out there today. And at the Boston Consulting Group, where Susan began her career, she became fascinated by the deep emotional connections that brands can build with consumers. She went on to work for a boutique branding agencies and focused on customer research, product innovation, and packaging design, and has had the privilege to work with some of the world's leading corporations, including Unilever, PepsiCo, Kellogg's, Mars, Samsung, Genentech, and Novartis. Susan holds a BA in art history from Dartmouth and is an MBA from Harvard. Her own creative output includes paintings, sculptures, jewelry, and children. (laughs) We're going to talk about branding and strategy and all of the fun things in this episode. And we're going to talk about workplace and the myths beyond creativity that kind of sometimes hold us back. And we're going to activate our inner creative hero, the power and playoffs of creativity at work. But before we do that, I have a couple things I need to do. I want to talk to you about Schedule Once or Once Hub. There's lots of different things that are within the whole Once Hub family, chatbots and scheduling superpowers. Uh, but basically, it's what we use to book time on our calendar. Schedule Once super powered customer scheduling. It also is what we use for our podcast bookings and all kinds of good stuff. It's really automating the calendaring process. I usually just tell people, use this link, find a time that works best for you. And it does all of the time conversions and everything for us. So it's awesome. It looks at my calendar. It gives people what is available to them that they could then go ahead and just book themselves. And it automates the whole system. It reminds them. It gives them a reminder right beforehand. It gives them a link to reschedule if they have to. Schedule once is awesome. Go to peppershock.com slash offers and you can get a link that will give us both perks as we've partnered with Schedule Once to do this for you. So again, peppershock.com slash offers and select the Schedule Once offer. Now it's time for me to tell you about our marketing essentials, the things that you need, the basic marketing tools and tactics that you need in order to help you build your brand and your bottom line on this marketing expedition that we're going on together. So today we're gonna talk about the benefits of Facebook groups for business. The right specific audience is a highly targeted audience. You allow people to join your group based on their profiles, right? You can ask them questions before they get into the group or before you admit them into your group, right? So that is number one, the right specific audience, highly targeted in your group. Number two, learn from one another. The people that are in your Facebook group are of like-minded, right? You let them in because they are of specific interest to your group. We have the Marketing Expedition Members Group, for example. It's a private group, people ask to join. They are all people who are interested in going on this marketing journey together with us. So we all learn from each other. We post information and inspiration and all kinds of insights and people comment and give other ideas. It's really a great way to continue to learn and grow. You can get important updates from your group or you'll give important updates to your audience. um, And it's really helpful to get that information that's to the right audience in that way. You can get honest feedback from your group members. You can ask them questions, you can do polls, you can get them to give you all kinds of feedback and things that they might wanna learn more about or information or topics that you wanna discuss or talk about. And it also increases engagement organically. So that's number five, increase engagement organically. So. We know that you have to pay to play if you're gonna do Facebook pages for your business. You can also advertise inside your group or inside somebody else's group to promote yours, but it really does increase organic engagement. So the groups are, of course, of all the like-minded people that you accept into your group, and organically, people are commenting and talking and liking and they're giving tips and all kinds of things that you can engage with your audience. So a Facebook group is helpful for that. 
The other thing, number six, increase leads or conversions. If you use your Facebook group as a tool to present yourself as an expert, show the expertise that you know, the knowledge that you can share, sometimes then people will want to learn more from you. And you can use that as a way to increase your leads and convert into higher paying, high ticket items or things that you can do to get calls to action that people will want to do. You want to include a subscription button. You'll want to have sign up now or maybe there's an event that you want to promote inside your group and these people will pay attention. And then number seven, of course, is becoming a part of a community. So like in the Marketing Expedition members Facebook group, our community is built with the audience that we intend to continue to grow and share and learn from just as much as they can learn from us. So building your own community and being a part of a community through Facebook groups is another helpful thing for you to do to help you build your brand and your bottom line through this Marketing Expedition journey that we're all on. So without further ado, let's get right into the interview with Susan. Welcome to Pepper Shock Media's Marketing Expedition Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in marketing and advertising. Now, here's your host, Ray Allen. Welcome to the Marketing Expedition Podcast. I'm your host, Ray Allen, and co-founder of Pepper Shock Media and TheMarketingExpedition.com. And today, we are talking with Susan Hamilton Muir as a brand strategist and visual artist and founder of the Susan Muir Studio. Welcome, Susan. Thank you so much for joining us today. How is it going in your world? What's happening in your world these days? Oh, well, I am in New York City, and uh, as you mentioned, my children, uh, school is... Uh, thinking about starting. Uh-huh, <laughs> so that's, uh-huh. that, that's, a, that's kind of a big topic in our world because they keep pushing back the start date of schools. Um, so that's what's happening on the personal front. Um, now are, so you, are you homeschooling? Are they, are they just, they haven't started at all? So they haven't started at all yet. Um, they're doing orientations. I have three children in three different schools, so I won't bore you with all the details. Oh my goodness. Um, but the New York City public schools are trying to figure out how to do a hybrid model to keep people safe from you know, COVID, uh-huh. um, but also get the kids engaged um, in their academics in a live format for at least part of the time. Um, So we are managing three different approaches from three different schools to that, Um, but it will be some combination of homeschooling and in-person learning, we hope. Meanwhile, trying to run your studio and doing all the things that you're doing, I can absolutely relate to that. In fact, you might even hear my kids in the background today. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. And we've all gotten used to Zoom having some interesting background noises on our on our business meetings, right? That's right. That's right. It's kind of the new normal, as they say. <laughs> so Susan, tell me kind of the path that you took, because uh, you, you, you worked at a variety of different places and with a lot of different brands. But just tell me kind of, in your own words, the path that you took uh, and to get to where you are now. Sure. So um You know, you mentioned that I I studied art and I make art and that's an ongoing and um, kind of really primary part of who I am and what I do. I early in my career had this amazing opportunity to work for a management consulting firm for the Boston Consulting Group. And I didn't know anything about business, but I found it really interesting. And what they essentially provide in those early uh, junior roles um, is, is an education. And so it really opened my eyes to the way that um, companies interacted with their customers. I worked mostly in the consumer practice there. And as you mentioned, I got really engaged by um, doing the customer research piece um, where you heard how people had these very personal, intimate relationships with the products and brands that they were using. And then our job was to help companies think about um, you know, how to do their marketing better, how to serve those customers better, how to come up with new products, innovations um, that would meet those needs or even surpass and delight uh, those needs. Um, and I, I found that really exciting. Um, and so after my time in, in management consulting, um, I decided to specialize in branding, um, which is an area where you can really dig deep into that world. Um, so I've always uh, continued to have that passion for research, for really listening to uh, human beings talk about their experiences. 
um, and what those mean, both their experiences in general, and then thinking about how whatever product or service it is that I'm representing as my client um, can fit into their world and make their world better. Um, so for about 15 years, um, I worked mostly in consumer goods. I did a lot of work in food, um, some in fashion, some in music across the board. Um, and then I started my own company and um, really just fortuitously started having um, clients come to me who worked in the tech space. Um, and a lot of that became healthcare tech. Um, and then moving from there, once you learn the vocabulary of healthcare, then I was able to work in pharmaceuticals, even a little bit of insurance, and I got really excited about the world of health because that felt to me like making a really positive contribution to the world. Um, you know, not that marketing cereal isn't fun and, and also positive, um, but I love working with at the forefront of um, medicine and wellness and um, thinking about how technology can improve the experience of people who are trying to manage their health. So that's what I focus on now. And you and I got the opportunity to talk before and you described one of the things that you do when you work with your customers and your you know clients and you bring them and you workshop and you kind of do some hands on things. Tell, tell our audience, like, what are some of the fun things that you do when you get people working and thinking about their branding and, and all those things. Yeah, so that's where I draw on my practice as an artist. And one of the things that I know firsthand from that, and there's also a lot of research about, um, is that thinking with your hands and also thinking in terms of um, abstraction in particular, um, really helps us activate a different part of our brains. And so something that corporations and teams within those corporations are always striving to do is be innovative. And coming up with new ideas is actually quite hard. Um, you know, and, and it's often, you know, you often have those blinders on of, okay, we have to come up with something by the next quarter. It's going to drive growth and it has to make these numbers. And that's, while necessary, isn't the best and most conducive way to actually come up with new ideas. So I help them um, in a series of workshops and different tools and processes um, to shift their mindset, if only for a while, um, to be able to activate their brains in a different way. So we do, um, you know, and this also, of course, has shifted a little bit now that we're in a virtual environment, but, right. you know, adapting those tools for a virtual environment um, I've really retained um, this uh, commitment to handmade, handwritten uh, processes. And so we now do these, um, I, I, so one of the tools I, I work with a lot is collaging. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a virtual environment, um, I actually just have them recreated in their own space. So instead of using um, an app or a piece of software where you do it digitally, um, we'll do a collage exercise just like we would do it in a room um, where I have them um, cut out pictures, write words on post-it notes, put those up on the wall behind them, and then we have a discussion around that. Um, sometimes I'll actually work with a group, particularly with innovation projects, I'll, I'll have them create an abstract um, collage or sculpture, mini sculpt, sculpture is a big word, right? But you know, using blocks or bits of paper or bits of mirror, or, you know, different kinds of- um, You've used Legos, have you done it with Legos before? done it with Legos, yeah. but Legos is a great way to do it. Um, yeah. I do know, I, I have heard of people using Legos for that. Um, but anything that mixes, you know, tactile shapes and colors and has them think about like, what would this look like? You know, where do I want my team to be uh, six months from now? Make a sculpture. And at first everybody's like, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can't do that. But it, it's really about the, con it doesn't matter what the sculpture looks like in the end. It's about the conversation that you have around like, well, why did you choose to make it look like that? Mm -hmm. And same thing with the collage. So another thing we'll do for positioning work, um, I'll say, you know, make a portrait of your customer. You know, take 50 pictures that you've either pulled out of magazines or printed out from online. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can also add some words on post-it notes if you can't find the pictures to say what you want. But the most important thing, and we take, take snapshots of what those look like at the end, and they often keep them and hang them up in the conference rooms because it's, it's mm -hmm. fun, it's a reminder of the experience. But what's important is the conversation where that mini team presents it to the room and says, here's what I think our customer's world is about. And those pictures and the activity of having done that together with their hands 
um, gets a much richer conversation going than if we just sat down cold and said, let's talk about our customers. Right. And I know that we use sticky notes a lot and I've had to also adapt. And so a couple apps that we've used for like the sticky notes and, and those types of things, it's like digital sticky notes that you can move around. One's called Jamboard. And then you and I talked about, oh, well, we could use mood boards on Pinterest if we had to make it all completely digital. You know, if people That's don't right. have access to magazines and things at their home, I mean, you don't normally do, but if you had to, we could make a, a, a Pinterest, you know, mood board to describe our ideal client or ideal, you know, person that we want to work with, right? That's right. Pinterest yeah. is a really cool tool. And what I like about that idea is that you're taking something from what typically is used in a personal realm and bringing it into a business context. So you're already a little bit flipping the channel of the way mm -hmm. that you're thinking. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And it's right, you, you kind of have to do hybrid where it's like, okay, we're in a digital space, but I want you to you know, actually touch things and move things around with your fingers. And, and I get that too, because it's different than what they're normally used to every day. And, and it's different too, because you're sitting on Zoom calls or you know, go-to meeting or whatever it is. And so now you get to play, right? right. <laughs> And, that's and the, that, that I'm glad that you raised that because the power of playing is yeah. also really important in activating your creativity. And when people are having fun, they're actually, and again, there is actual academic research on this. They mm -hmm. are accessing more of their creative powers. They are more likely to come up with um, viable new ideas when they're in that mode of play. So do you have a specific example or client that comes to mind that you've gone through this process with them and kind of the outcome, what happened, uh, you know, what, what, where, are, where are they now? Like where in the world are they now after you've gone through this with them? Tell me more about what you did and how you helped them. Sure. Um, so uh, one of my clients uh, is a digital health um, tool there. Um, well, I, it's Doximity. I don't know if you've heard of them within the healthcare world. They're quite famous. Um, and they uh, started out as a place where doctors could put up their profiles, kind of like a LinkedIn um, situation, a platform. Not, not, like not match.com or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, not as sexy as that, but it's pretty sexy <laughs> if you're a doctor. <laughs> so um, so I, I give them as an example because I worked with them over, uh, have worked with them over a long number of years, and we've sort of gone through all the cycles of um, all the different things that you know that I do for clients yeah. and um, and they've been such a great success story because they've had exponential growth um, and they were you know a young and growing rapidly growing company when I started working with them several years ago um, by the way, um, doctors yeah. I just have to interrupt because uh, just because they have MD at the end of their name does not make them marketing directors <laughs> I heard that somebody told me that one time I'm like you know what it, you, it takes a bit to you know un uncover because they're, they're just so smart right and so when you're working with them you know you have to remind them that they're not the marketing directors right <laughs> <laughs> and in fact I you know I've actually worked with and interviewed doctors for lots of different clients and you know some of them are savvy business people and others really want nothing to do with the business end of it so it's interesting like the different tools yeah. that they use in that sphere um but all super smart that's for sure yeah um but and so the team at doximity has doctors in residence on that team who are helping to build these tools for doctors so that they're looking at it from their point of view but one of their key client groups in terms of their revenue model is actually pharma marketers and so they were trying to understand how they can serve them better. Um, and so when I first started working with them, I said, let's go out and talk to them and let's actually record those interviews. Let's bring them visual stimulus. Let's bring them card, you know, words on cards so they can sort through what the brand attributes are that they perceive about us, that they care about, um, because we were also creating a new uh, really a new category. Um, so what started out as this kind of LinkedIn platform, um, really the vision was to create a whole uh, set of tools and resources mm -hmm. that doctors, nurses, everybody in the healthcare sphere um, could use on a daily basis to keep up their medical knowledge, um, to be able to connect with other doctors, potentially connect with patients, but certainly share patient information, which is a tricky thing in that world. In oh yeah, absolutely. Reality. Um, and so they really made great strides on all of that front, uh, all of those fronts. Um, and so 
um, you know, pharmaceutical companies who have new therapies, for example, um, this is a great way for them to introduce those therapies to the market that they're trying to reach. Um, but, you know, and I, I, I don't want to go too far into detail in a, what's a, you know, a small segment, but I think it's really interesting to say, or something I find really interesting is that doing this sort of specialty niche business to business kind of world um, is actually exactly the same principles apply when you're marketing cereals to moms, right? And I think that was actually a big insight and a big help for them that thinking about, you know, the person who's buying our service, um, which is not something that you're going to easily explain to the man on the street, is actually still a human being who has aspirations, professional and personal, that we can and should be addressing. And so we spent a lot of time speaking to those decision makers about what does their day look like? What does their world look like? You know, who do they aspire to be at work? And how does a tool like this potentially help them with that? Which is really different from talking about features and functionality or talking about media spend and, you know what I mean, and, you know, mm -hmm. click throughs, um, which in that world is typically what gets talked about. And those things are important and they need to know the metrics, but it was really powerful for them to hear directly from the customer's mouth um, why they choose to work with um, various vendors and with them in particular and what they're looking for out of that experience um, beyond the numbers and the metrics and that so helps those that don't want to have much to do with the business side but it helps them see another side of, of what you know can, they can empathize with their buyers and why they're gonna buy from them so that's, that's great. great that's yeah. right so we created a out of that um, research, we were able to create a positioning, you know, meaning here's our message, package that in a way that they can then leverage across their sales materials, across their website, across their social media um, that succinctly um, expresses what it is that's unique about them. Um, for, and that's really relevant to their customers. And you know, that's the holy grail for a positioning is that you encapsulate what it is that you're promising to your customers um, in a way that's relevant and meaningful to them, in a way that's simple enough for them to understand um, very quickly, but also nuanced enough to be unique, you know, so that's not generic. I um, want to so, show that they have good bedside manner, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so and there's a lot more follow-up work that gets done after, you know, you land on a positioning to um, implement that um, across all the modes of expression and then think about how that applies to innovation. Um, but anyway, so that, that's a project that I'm, a, a client that I have a great relationship with and that I'm particularly proud of. That's great. And then you kind of took this journey for your own agency. Tell me about what you went through and what you learned because, you know, practice what you preach, right? And they always say, what is it, the shoemaker's daughter has no shoes or something, but you actually took the time to do this for yourself, right? I use that expression all the time because I, I'm continually amazed at how difficult it is for me to do for myself what I do for my clients. Yeah. And I recently actually, um, had the discipline to sit down and say, I'm going to actually take myself and my business through the pro, not just think about it, but actually sit down and do the steps of what I take my clients through and come out the other end with a refreshed website and, you know, set of messaging. And, a, and I, I made myself a brand book, you know, with the, here's the customer's aspiration. Here's the key insight. Here's what I deliver. And here's what I promise. And here's what's unique about me and my business and it was such a good exercise um and uh part of the reason i did it is because you know it's important to do for any business as you point out part of the reason i was doing that is one of the things that i've been working on and t test driving is how can i translate um the tools and processes that i use with large corporate clients and have been doing for a long time how can I package that in a really user-friendly, somewhat DIY way that's affordable for small businesses? Because I often get approached by smaller businesses and I often do work either pro bono or you know, friends and family just to help mm -hmm. out. Um, but I, I think it would be really great. And I, you know, I've now test driven it with a handful of clients and keep refining it. But um, I'm really excited about that idea as well. 
you know, there are, there are a few steps that you can follow and I can make those steps really clear and tangible, give a little kind of consulting on either end of that process, but this mm -hmm. is something that you can do for yourself, for your business. Um, so well, this is just very timely. I'm, I'm uh, teaching a marketing class, an upper division marketing class at Boise State University here in Idaho. And uh, we are talking about they're creating their agency. So it's agency operations. They're creating their own agencies and teams and of course, socially distanced and safe. Uh, and, and then they're going to have a brand that they're going to represent as an agency team and talking about the naming and the, the color scheme and the fonts that they use and the messaging and who they want to serve and how they want to serve. And, and it's, it's fun to talk about that and, and actually go through that process. And, you know, you have to do it for yourself just as much as you can do it for your clients too. And so I love that you're doing that. And, and I feel like uh, we need to do more of it, you know, <laughs> and keep up with it. Things that even though it's really fun, it can sometimes fall to the bottom of the priority list if there are right. fires to be put out. Um, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to dedicate that time, man. It is tough for sure. You know what I found with, you know, with those client success stories, you are actually able to connect the dots back to, you know, we, 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 we use that process to come to that brand positioning, to then recreate the sales materials. And we got a sales bump in the next quarter. You know, there is, uh, you know, obviously nothing operates in a vacuum, but it, it is real, you know, that yeah. being able to, to know yourself and talk about yourself in a um, clear and relevant way does help you. Absolutely. Well, and people always say, well, how do you measure and, you know, that you're getting a return on your marketing investment, you know, ROI on marketing. That's always like the one thing that people always say, you know, I don't know if I'm doing what's working or not, but it's true. I mean, even if it's branding, which is, you know, kind of hard to, to measure, but you can see the results on, like you said, an uptick in sales or more inquiries or things that are in alignment with the right audience. And then you're attracting the right people. And so by doing that process, ideally, you know, it's a long-term game, but you can still get the right people through your doors, right? Or through your virtual doors, if you will. Absolutely. <laughs> and another part of it is elevating the level of professionalism at which you're working. So tightening your message. And you mentioned a lot of the other visual pieces of branding, which of course is another thing that drew me into branding because that's all of a piece. So once you get that strategy and that message, then you're expressing that in pictures and colors and fonts. Um, but when you tighten all of that up, you take your business to, and even if you're a large business, this is true, you take your business to a next level. And so I've had a number of clients who went through this process and shortly thereafter were acquired. You know, so part of it was they were probably thinking about that and, you know, we need to, you know, kind of up our game and then it worked, right? You know, so you come out and you've got your fancy new dress on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then yeah. And now you don't want to show up in your old frock to the prom. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So part of it is uh, kind of presenting yourself um, to the world in a, in a professional and appealing way. Very cool. So Susan, what do you see coming up in the next year, two years, uh, some marketing trends that you're seeing that's happening, things that you want to spend more time with or more interest in that you want to help do for your clients? Well, certainly the pandemic has highlighted um, the potential for telemedicine, which you know, has been on people's minds for a long time, but there is a number of hurdles in terms of, um, you know, people's willingness to accept that format and for insurance companies' willingness to pay for that format, which have just been blown through by what we've been experiencing. So I'm really excited about that space. Yeah. And I'm expecting to see a enormous growth in that area. And, you know, I would love to be a part of that and, and yeah. do some work in that area. Um, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what innovations come out of, um, of this time period as well, because, you know, whenever you have a time of challenge and dare I say hardship, but certainly, you know, increased constraints, let's call it that historically, you always find that people are so resilient and so creative and we're now forcing them to be creative. <laughs> There are certain things that just got a lot less easy. And so 
you know, market forces are going to come right in already are coming right in. I mean, look at the platform we're using right now, the <laughs> exponential growth of um, online visual communications and communities. Um, it's very exciting to see what's happening now and what's going to be happening in the next few years. Um, education, as we were discussing before, you know, ed tech is a hugely growing space. Mm -hmm. um, I am working with a client right now who's a startup, who's one of my um, clients that I'm working with this streamlined, more DIY process because, you know, in the, they're in the early stages of funding um, and they don't have, you know, six months and $100,000 to spend, um, mm -hmm. but they need that process to say, you know, who are we, first of all, so that they can go and take their message clearly to teachers and the right teachers that they're trying to attract. And also, you know, when they go out to the investor community. Um, but anyway, so that space I'm very engaged in, I think is really exciting. Um, and I think we're gonna see a lot of growth there. You know, well. you, you, you make a good point. And I also was just thinking about FinTech and how it's exploded and, and changed a lot too, because my dad had to close on his house and it was all, all completely remote. Uh, or virtual, you know, and um, before you always had to go and sign the dotted line and, you know, be there in person. And uh, yeah, so financial technology has immensely grown as well. And I think it's going to continue down that path too, just like you said, for, for all of these different industries. They got to pivot and adapt and grow, right? <laughs> the one other thing I would add, though, as a counterbalance to that, I'm actually very curious to see uh, what happens or what kind of comes to pass, you know, a year or two from now when mm -hmm. we start to emerge from this hunkering down undercover phase of things and reemerge into the world in a less guarded way. I feel like there's so much pent up demand for human contact. Well, and tourism industry, I hope will recover in a big way because then people will want to travel because we've all been grounded, if you will. We're, adults are getting grounded. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can't fly anywhere. No, you can't go anywhere, you know? So I'm, right. I'm like, where can I go in a day that's, you know, close by, but yet, you know. <laughs> Driving distance vacations are where it's at at the moment. Yeah, staycations, but, but I want to get out. I want to go places. So yeah, and hopefully there's some industries that will recover quickly and, and, and better in a different way, you know, they'll have to adapt for sure. And it's kind of fun to be on the forefront. I mean, we're in the middle of history right now, right? If, if you know, it'll, people will talk about it, you know, pre-pandemic, during pandemic, post-pandemic, I hope their post-pandemic comes very soon. <laughs> we're not quite there yet, but I hope it comes soon, you know, and, and, and adapting to this, you, you'll always be like, well, I remember when during the pandemic, we, you know, watched Tiger King. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I watched the whole thing. It's, 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 it's a deep psychological metaphor in there somewhere. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but other things too, like you said, I mean, there's there's got to be some silver lining out of this because now, uh, you know, people are Zooming and they're, you know, they're not commuting as much anymore. I, I honestly thought podcasts were going to, you know, not be as, uh, as prevalent and, and grow as much because, oh, well, people aren't commuting right now. You know, they're commuting from their couch to their kitchen and uh, where's time for podcasts? But it's actually grown exponentially. And we started seeing an uptick because people want, you know, things to do. They want to you know, quality, productive things to do, not just wasted time on, you know, <laughs> binge watching things like that. But that's fascinating. I'm actually curious to know, do you know, so if you think of like that, that commuting um, podcast experience as an occasion, is there a new occasion that's come up or is it more diffuse? It's more like people are yeah. doing whenever, wherever, at yeah. home, or is there like a time when people are listening to their podcast? I think we have to reevaluate where, because it used to be, yeah, people would listen to them commuting or if they're working out or, you know, average length of, of podcast should be, you know, 22 to 30 minutes because that's the average commute time. Well, now it's the average workout time, an hour maybe. I mean, I don't know. People have varying stages, but, uh, you know, podcast podcasts are being listened to in a variety of different stages now and and you know with ear pods and and it used to be that if people are flying they would have it but road trips you know that's kind of where I'm listening is on road trips and I'll have multiples right. to listen to or a series and and so yeah I honestly think it's just now completely random and, and because people's schedules have changed too you know normal school hours have changed normal life has changed in general yeah. 
Uh, so I'd be curious to know that too. Like when are people actually listening to podcasts and, and why is it, why is it becoming more increasingly listened to? Why have our downloads, you know, I think we've almost tripled our number of downloads since, you know, pre pandemic. Wow. So it's definitely something that is, is growing and not only me, but other, other people in the industry too. So I think it's an exciting time, you know, it's an exciting time to be on a podcast, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed it is. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Um, let me ask you a couple more things, just, uh, just kind of get to know you a little bit more. So, so when you work with a client, um, how do you work? How, how do you structure it? Um, you said, you know, small business clients, you're kind of, you know, packaging things together. Do you, do you work with them on uh, like six months, two months? How does that work for you? So a typical, before we get to the smaller businesses, a typical yeah. project for me has always been three to six months. And the size, since starting my own company, the size of the client is generally, um, or I would say mid to large size. So if it's a really large corporate client, it's usually me in a collaboration with another agency, mm -hmm. um, you know, or they're doing a large project where they've hired a number of different partners who each specialize in something different. Or if it's more of a, we're doing a soup to nuts branding and marketing project and I'm the one leading it, it's usually more of a mid-sized company, like, I don't know, 30 to $50 million type of size. The process, uh, like I said, I, I went through to create this workbook for the smaller companies. What I did was I really went back and analyzed what process I, because uh, I create the process custom for every client. Mm -hmm. I don't use an off the shelf mm -hmm. approach, mm -hmm. but I kind of have the feel because I've been doing it for so long. Yeah. I know in my head what they need and I listen to their brief and, you know, sometimes people come to me and they've done a lot of customer research. And so then it has like the brief or time. grief. I listen to their brief. brief or brief. Uh -huh. brief. Although it kind of makes sense. It, it sometimes is. <laughs> You know, uh, like when you brief an ad agency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I honestly thought you said brief. I was like, well, that kind of works too. <laughs> it works. Yes. It, it's, I am also have an ear open for what their disgruntlements are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but when they, you know, I, I usually write what I call the brief for them. So what I heard you say is you're yeah. looking for, you know, here's what your objectives are. Here's what you've done to date, and here's your open questions, and then I'll put together a process for them. But what it, you know, what it turns out to be when I look back over the last, let's say, ten years of work that I've done is there are you know there are a lot of similarities in terms of the cadence, and what you know, and when I summarize that, it makes a lot of sense because if I were just talking to you without having done that work, I would tell you, well, first you need to know yourself. And then you need to know your customers and then you need to think about how you're different from what everything else is out there. And so the process more or less follows those steps. It might go in a slightly different order, like I said, depending on what work they've done to date or what their priorities are. Um, but there's a part of the process where they're self-reflecting, thinking about, you know, and aligning, by the way, because sometimes organizations aren't aligned on who they are and what they care about. Um, but thinking, you know, what are our values? And so, you know, what does our brand stand for? Um, and what's our vision for, you know, where that goes from here into the future? Um, what are we good at? You know, what are our capabilities? What do we want to leverage? Um, and, you know, what do we care about? Um, and so they'll write a little manifesto, you know, coming out of that. Um, and we'll, I usually turn that into uh, some stimulus, like some pictures and phrases that I can then test with their customers. So then there's the like, okay, who are they? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is really starting with, we're not even sure what our target markets are. You know, we don't know really how this thing, we're just trying to put stuff out there. And so mm -hmm. I help them code, you know, a hypothesis of, you know, who do you think you're most, you know, you can't serve everybody. At least right. you can't do that forever. Um, and so, you know, who do you think your priority segments are? Let's go and talk to them, hear what they have to say, hear what they have in common, hear what's different across them, and hear what it is that they actually think of you, what they actually think of everybody else, and what they actually care about in terms of what your offering is. Do some um, then, mapping to step in their shoes and kind yeah. of think about it like, yeah, who, what, where, why, how are they feeling? What are they saying? What are they doing? You know, just really understanding them, right? And, and creating who it is that you want to target most and why. That's yeah. Cool. 
Yeah, and while I don't always do formal, what are called ethnographies, I always take that ethnographic approach of like thinking about, as I was saying before, you know, what does your day look like? Before we talk about my product or my brand that I'm here to talk to you about, tell me about you. Like, what's your world all about? Walk me through the journey of your day. And you learn so much and you also make a connection, right? That like mm -hmm. makes that conversation a lot deeper um, by taking the time to hear about that. Yeah, that's great. Um, so those are the bits. And then, you know, you put them all together and wave a magic wand and out comes your brand promise. <laughs> right. There you go. And, and condense it down and massage it a little bit, make those words work for you. And then there you have it. Excellent. So, so Susan, what is your brand promise for your business? So uh, this is the intersection of imagination and logic. Um, so I'm bringing that kind of artist brain together with that business school brain. And those are the two things I am really passionate about. And I, you know, for a long time in my career, people thought I was kind of a weirdo and didn't really know exactly which place to put me. And I maybe thought I was a weirdo. And then it turns out when I asked my clients why it is that they like working with me and what value they think that I bring that's different from other people, it's that. Yeah. And so, okay, I'll, you know, I'll say that right out there. I, I have believed for a long time that the, you know, that kind of overlap of you take the analytical approach and then you have, then you let go of that completely and you get all creative and then you come back to the analytics and you sort of yep. toggle back and forth. That's how I work. That's how I'm wired. I can't do it any other way. Yep. Um, and I'm so pleased to hear that that's actually, no, <laughs> that that's that's actually good. value <laughs> and that it, it, that it does seem to be unique. And so that's my brand promise and you know, that I'm going to help you, um, you know, spark what's next for your business get the results that you're looking for um, and, you know, move you to a different place by applying that kind of unique custom process. Um, that's by it's the way. Like, uh, I used to tell people, I said, you can make a beautiful website and, and it can be amazing and just, you know, very aesthetically pleasing and everything in navigation is wonderful, but it might be a flash site and no one can find it. So it's highly ineffective if no one can find you, right? So yeah, merging the two together to make sure that people can see it, see this amazingly aesthetic looking thing that you've created. Uh, yeah, it has to be functional too. So you're right. I mean, it is both that come together that make it highly effective in, in those worlds. So I think that, yes, the world needs people like you who can think both ways, right? <laughs> That's awesome. I think one, um, tangible way that that often materializes is in the power of envisioning information. So, and especially in the worlds that I work in now with people who are scientists and engineers and they're incredibly smart and they're coming up with these like really novel ideas, but they don't have any background of like how to make that, um, clear to people outside of their sphere, you know, who speak a different language essentially from what they speak and they, almost never think about it in terms of, oh, an illustration might be able to bring this to light, you know, or we need to create a diagram so people understand the flow of this process. And so being able, or, or you know, the data um, behind what we're trying to say. And so bringing that, you know, actual visual uh, element to it um, is, tremendously powerful um, in a world where that's not the way people typically communicate with each other, but need to communicate that way with their customers. So, okay, one last question for you. What are some of the resources or podcasts that you've listened to or books that you've read, things that our listeners can, you know, glean from you as far as resources that they could tap into that's helped you along your, your journey? Sure. Um, so I listen a lot to um, Happier with Gretchen Rubin. I think, you know, that's mostly on the personal front, but I also think it's really powerful on the professional front. She taps a lot into behavior change. And, you know, as we were talking about before, the power of play to actually help with productivity, not just be a break from productivity. So I find, you know, her theme really interesting and that, you know, she's just very engaging. Um, I read this on that same similar theme, um, the book Joyful um, by Ingrid Fatali. Um, I found really uh, 
exciting and fun to read. She kind of recounts her adventures, which are phenomenal uh, around the world while writing this book. But, but the uh, information in the book that I think is super useful is thinking about uh, the aesthetics of joy. So this is now on the expression side. Once you've decided what to do with your brand from a strategic perspective, how do you actually express that? Talk about envisioning information. How do you convey your particular brand of joy mm -hmm. um, brand meaning something different in that context, your particular right. version of joy um, that you're that you're spreading in the world with your brand or your product. Um, and so she has so many inspirational ideas in there of um, how to bring to life what it is that you're trying to express. Um, I also recently read, um, which has been out for a while now, but um, uh, Susan Cain founded this uh, organization called The Quiet Revolution, wrote a book called Quiet, which is about, uh, I think the subtitle is something like The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, uh. and, and uh, it really resonates with me because I am um, an introvert, like a Myers-Briggs introvert, mm -hmm. if you're mm -hmm. familiar with that mm -hmm. little framework, you know, person who recharges yeah. their batteries alone very much so. And yet, I, as you can see, don't have a problem talking, um, <laughs> but, but you do navigate. So uh, people never think I'm an introvert, but I do need to navigate the world a little differently from, for example, most of my peers at Harvard Business School or at the Boston Consulting Group who are almost exclusively extroverts. I learned early on, like, oh, I, I'm somehow a little bit different in the way that I you know, need to. You have to become an ambivert, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Kind of, you know. <laughs> yeah, and just carve out the space for yourself, you know, just figure it out, which, you know, is easier now than it was when it was like my first job out. But um, yeah, so I don't know. So those are some of the things that have been on my roster. Oh, and the other podcast I listen to um, religiously is uh, called Un, which is produced by um, Umbrex, which is a- What was it called? One more time? Call it, call it again. Unleashed. Unleashed. Okay. Unleashed. And it's for independent consultants, independent professionals. Um, and so it's just full of really relevant, useful resources for people like me who are running their own typically mm -hmm. service businesses. And all of the questions that you have when you're working as an independent um, proprietor, um, which kind of magically get answered when you work in a corporation, but do not when you're yeah. on your own, yeah. um, that uh, podcast addresses all of those types yeah. of topics. And that, you know, that's one that I was always like, my commute was the Unleashed podcast. Unleashed. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what's your commuter podcast? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was it. Um, but yeah. And, and I, I am doing the things that you mentioned. I'm so curious to see, cause I'm sure there's research going on about this. Like what are people do? What are the occasions now? Yeah. Yeah. Mine are working out, as you mentioned, uh -huh. working out and then the longer road trips mm -hmm. or like bin, binge listening, I guess you would call yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Serial <that's>, listening. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> listening. Serial no. podcast is another good one, not ah. from a work perspective, but boy, is that a really interesting podcast. I love that. <laughs> mm. Well, Susan, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the Marketing Expedition podcast and sharing your journey with us and, and uh, all of the things that you have put together. I think it's great to have you share what you've known for our listeners too. But any uh, last words of wisdom that you want to share with, with everyone? Oh, my dripping nuggets of gold from my mouth. Now we covered everything. This was such a great conversation. <laughs> oh, I really appreciate it. And how do people get a hold of you? That's the last one. Oh, okay. So Susan Meyer Studio uh, is the name of my company, and SusanMeyerStudio.com is my website. But because it's sometimes tricky to spell my name, um, I also have a landing page called ElectrifyYourWork.com, which will then connect you into everything. ElectrifyYourWork.com. Okay, yes, indeed. Well, thank you again. And we are delighted to have people like you with such great energy. And so thanks, Susan. Thank you so much. All right. For the listeners, thank you for subscribing and sharing and recommending and all the things that you can do to help us grow our podcast as well. And until next time, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to the Marketing Expedition Podcast. Find more online at Peppershock.com.
Wouldn't it be great if there was one place you can go to get all the latest information and tips about marketing and advertising? The Marketing Expedition community is that place. People like you gather in our online community to build relationships with others and find the latest marketing trends, tactics, tools, and technology. We help you build your brand and your bottom line. Start your adventure today. Visit themarketingexpedition.com to find out more.